The challenges that can meet, uh, meet us during cataract surgery or anterior segment surgery are numerous. We can assemble them, we can divide it into yeah, subcategories. Subcategories, mechanical, you're not sitting comfortably, or physical of the patient, yeah, either from your side or from the patient's side, or something obscuring your visualization, corneal uh, opacity, or very narrow pupil, or membranes over the lens, or awkward situations like uh, I'm going to show you, which is very interesting. Or challenging if, if you don't understand the concept of what you're doing for the particular case. I will go through with you in multiple challenging cases uh, as much as we can during this time. And I will start with the soft cataract. Although soft cataract could be easy surgery, but if you don't know the concept of how to manage these cases, <clears throat> you are going to have trouble if you manage a soft cataract like uh, an ordinary nucleus of grade two or three. And that's why we used to tell residents, don't start with soft cataract. But once you understand the concept, then you can move on soft cataract very uh, smoothly. So let's go now into the cases. The, the key in soft cataract is a proper capsulorexis and hydrosection and hydration. Remember, it is capsulorexis, hydration, hydration, hydration. I'm not going to crack the nucleus like normally. You're not going to rotate the nucleus in the normal way. You are going to do hydrosection and hydration. And, and the key for this is a proper capsulorexis that will allow you to do all these maneuvers safely. See, hi, hi, this is hydrosection, and then you start hydrating the nucleus. Capsulorexis, proper capsulorexis. And the same technique, you can apply it in pediatric cataract surgery, because it's a soft cataract as well. So capsulorexis, give time to do a proper capsulorexis. Then you do hydrodissection, hydration, hydration, as if you're doing hydrodelineation, but you hydrate all the nucleus. Hydrosection, you go into the substance, inject and inject more and more until the nucleus prolapses or becomes like an amalgam. Once you reach this step, it's very easy. All you need to do is phaco aspiration. You don't have to maneuver, cut, uh, you only will use the second hand to help to feed the phaco tip, what it is aspirating. As you can see here, you don't you need power, you don't need power at all, just aspirating. And you could not reach this step unless you have done proper hydration. So the challenge in soft cataract is to do a proper uh, capsular access, then proper hydration of the whole substance of the lens. Let's move to more uh, difficult situation. And again, the concept of the technique is the most important. Understanding what is the problem to deal. This is a very difficult case. And the challenge here, the patient was very old. He has problems in his back. Luckily, we have this, luckily we have this uh, type of uh, operating table. And he has black cataract. So I had to work standing. And working standing is not easy. You, you will use one foot sw switch only, the foot switch of the FACO. And the, the adjustment of the microscope, somebody else will do it for you. And then after adjusting yourself to the awkward situation, then you have to deal with the hard cataract. And the hard cataract, you will have to deal by converting this difficult case into a regular case. You don't see the capsule, then do capsular staining. And make sure you make a proper rexus, continuous, and a bit larger than you are used to because you are going to manipulate a lot within the capsular bag. So this is a true black cataract, true cataracta negra. Making sure that I'm, 
I'm doing the proper rexes. No hydrosection. And you can see here, I'm exposing the tip very much. And this is very important. You see, when I, I started to do the double nuclei concept, trying to shave the upper part now, and this is a large tip going from 2.8 millimeter incision. I realized at this moment that I did not complete the rexes because the visualization was not perfect, even with the stain because it's a black cataract. So I stopped and then you can see here the capsular rexes. I regrasped and continued my rexes. If I don't, if I miss seeing this, I will get into pro problems and serious problems later, later on. As you can see, magnification is helping me to see every single detail. And now I'm using the concept to, de to debulk the nucleus, making large wide groove. And then after doing this, I start now to do what I call hole drilling to weaken the shell of the nucleus. 330 degrees and 660 degrees. And you can see I can rotate the nucleus perfectly even I did not do any hydrosection. And this is an important thing that you should know. In hard cataracts, don't hi do hydrosection. You don't need to do hydrosection. You can see working, standing is difficult. And you have to be trained very much to be able to do this. But what I want to share with you is the technique of chopping the nucleus, working in the capsular bag as much as possible. Because if you work in the capsular bag, you're furthest away from the cornea. And once you start to get parts here, you use the least power. And you can know that I'm using le very little power because there is no chattering of the nucleus. The, the nucleus is not chattering in front of the phaco tip. You just hold it and cut chop into smaller and smaller pieces the nucleus to feed it into the phaco tip. This is very important to, to change an extremely difficult case into a regular case that you are using the same techniques with some modifications and all the time you can protect the corneal endothelium. As you can see, you saw here, I injected more viscoelastic and pushed back the nucleus into the capsular bag in the posterior chamber. I want to be further away from the, the, the cornea. And we have to remember and understand that it is not the time of ultrasound that affects the corneal endothelium. It is where you are doing the ultrasound. So as much as possible, if you are using ultrasound, don't use it near the corneal endothelium. Stay in the capsular bag. And you cannot stay in the capsular bag except if you have a good proper rexus. As you can see, the pupil is coming down, but using the vertical chopping technique always allows you to work in any size of a pupil. Smaller, following all the cracks, you see the fibers that are preventing me from cracking, I can see it. So I can crack into smaller and smaller pieces. My settings at this situation, the power maybe is 40% and the, the vacuum is 450 millimeters of mercury. The flow rate is 40 cc's per minute. You can, of course, change the settings as much as you are comfortable with the machine. But the whole idea here to understand, you don't need the power. You need the vacuum to manipulate the nucleus, as you can see. It's very important to work gently in a step manner, understanding what you are afraid from. It's not only concentrating of removing the nucleus. If you concentrate only in removing the nucleus, then you will uh, insult the corneal endothelium, and maybe you will insult as well the uh, posterior capsule. So you can tell that there is no insert to the cornea, the cornea is clear. And here, this is an important hint. Even I felt that I finished the nucleus. Actually, it's a huge nucleus. Almost half of the nucleus is still there. When, when the pupil came down, so it, it concealed this part of the nucleus. Always in heart nuclei, look under the iris. Make sure that you did not 
forget a fragment under the iris. It's very important. The technique is very simple. Once you understand it, you can tackle any type of cataract. Let's move to another problem or an, another challenge. Of course, subluxation can present in so many different ways. But one of the, I will try to get two examples or three examples. This is a case presenting with traumatic subluxation. Intraoperatively, you can see the zonulysis and you can see vitreous already present in the anterior chamber, passing in front of the lens. You cannot start except if you remove this vitreous to, to, make, to help the lens to be positioned in place. So with high cutting rate, low vacuum, I'm making sure that the lens is back. I made in here, you can see inadvertently, I cut the, uh, the iris with the ocutum. It's no problem, it's only a cosmetic problem. And then I start to do the capsulorexis, which is usually small, and you try to make it as much as possible central. See the folds indicating the subluxation. Here is a small continuous rexis. that I can go through and try to check if how to position this lens in place. This is manual a form of hydrosection. And then working with low infusion, low power, low vacuum, very slowly to see if I can remove the nucleus. Once you remove part of the nucleus, the support of the capsular bag decreases and some of vitreous is coming out again, you should stop, you should see it, remove the vitreous that is coming out. And that now, this, I thought the time to put a capsule tension ring. The capsule tension ring will help to support the, the whole capsular uh, complex in place to be able to continue the surgery. Sometimes you can put the capsular tension ring, and then you might need capsular hooks as well. Here, I did not need, I'm going to do irrigation aspiration. The lens is centered in place, and I don't do stress at the area of subluxation. Injecting viscoelastic, always have the, the, the bag inflated. Now, I'm enlarging the capsulorexis that you remember that it was small at the beginning. I'm enlarging the capsular axis, making sure that I'm blocking the area of zonulysis with viscoelastic. See, I'm enlarging the capsular axis. And then continue dry aspiration because I felt that it's too much fluid going back through the zonulysis area. So always make use of viscoelastic. I'm using here methyl cellulose because it's viscodispersive and it it's very helpful. Remember some of the challenges. If you have still cortex with the capsular tension ring in place, it's a little bit difficult and it needs a little bit patient to be able to aspirate the, the cortex, which is entrapped in the capsular bag with the capsule tension ring. Again, making sure there is no vitreous strands because if you have vitreous strands here, it will prevent the lens from settling in the right position and will give you troubles later on postoperatively. So don't hesitate to do multiple times vitrectomy to make sure you don't have any vitreous. Injecting again, viscodispersive. The bag now is intact, inflated forming the anterior chamber and getting ready to implant the lens. In this situation, you can implant a three-piece lens like this one, sensor lens that unfolds, you make sure it unfolds in the capsular bag that will add more support to the, uh, to the uh, ring. Here, the problem was the, the lens was loaded in the wrong way. So as you saw, 
this is very challenging and very dangerous that the haptic unfolded in uncontrolled way in the wrong direction. So we have to correct this. And in this case, you can still implant in the capsular bag one piece lens and better to be 13 millimeters overall diameter. This is another example of a Marfan syndrome in a child. So again, you, you have to do a tiny rexis, try to make it as central as possible. And remember, these cases are progressive. There is progressive zonulysis, not like traumatic cases. So from the beginning, I, I made a pocket, Hoffman pocket, planning to fixate at least one haptic of the lens I'm going to implant. Here from the beginning, I inserted a capsule tension ring to center the lens. Then I'm adding capsular hooks that are gentle and long and blunt to the capsule to fix it and center the lens in a better position. Remember, this is a soft cataract, so I'm following the technique of hydration, hydration of the contents of the capsular bag, and then all what you need to do normally in, in a young child is irrigation aspiration. After you finish, you check any vitreous prolapsing from the area of zonulysis, remove it, and then check how the lens how the capsular bag can be stretched into place to decide your plan. Now this is a three-piece lens that I'm going to implant in the sulcus, not in the capsular bag, because this is a progressive type of zonulysis. And from the beginning, I, I made a Hoffman pocket that I'll have the, the knot embedded in this Hoffman po pocket. And I, um, I only sutured one haptic. The rest of the haptic is, will be placed on the whole capsular bag in the sulcus. So in this way, you guarantee long-term stability of the lens in the sulcus in these patients that are very critical and they usually need good vision and good results and you don't want to admit them multiple times to search. Third example, which is a very rare case. I, I found this case with very long interior inserted zonules, as you see here. So because I never saw this case before, I thought my only challenge will be doing a capsulorexis. Continuous capsulorexis. So I decided I'll do a capsulorexis a little bit smaller, trying to avoid as much as possible these zonules so as not to extend you can see i'm passing through parts of the zonules it's very centrally inserted and once you learn and see such a case you will learn to look for them on the slit lamp and in surgery at the beginning of surgery you will see a lot of this variation you see here look this is the last area i'm very happy it's a very continuous rexus but look here i'm stripping the zonules, but I got a continuous rexus stripping of the zonules. I got the posterior rex uh, anterior rexus. Everything is fine. I'm going into a regular normal case that I thought it's going to be a piece of cake, which was not true. Now I'm starting doing my regular technique. chopping, aspirating with high vacuum, just so that the, the whole bag is moving. So I stopped to check what is it. I started to think about possible zonulysis. I'm trying to do fake, uh, uh, mobilization of the whole contents of the bag now. And I thought, okay, maybe I can prepare capsule tension ring. I will spray it and everything will be fine. I sprayed the container. But you can see the whole bag is coming. I did not catch the bag. Up till this moment, there is no vitreous. Up till this moment, the bag is intact. But there is extensive zonulysis. So I have to think what to do. But all these options, 
it was too late for me. I, I was inflating the bag thinking I can put a tension ring. No, it's very difficult because the whole bag is, is uh, loose of any zinules. So, and it, at this position, it's difficult to suture even the tension ring. And it was my first time to face such a problem. So now the, the idea was to remove all the contents and even to remove the whole capsular bag. Checking this, the first time I see the vitreous strand, I'm doing anterior vitrectomy. I have no capsular support, so I have to think what are my options. You can have all these options, but I chose to use an iris fixated lens, posterior enclavation, and in posterior enclavation, you turn the, the lens upside down, and I implanted the lens in the uh, posterior chamber. This is called long anterior denules syndrome. This was the, the first time for me to see it. And it can be complete like this case or partial. And usually these patients can have glaucoma preoperative or more so postoperative. So we should learn that even how much experience you had, how much many cases you had, you had seen, still there are new cases, you have to look for it. And if you are faced with a problem, try to look in the literature, try to look to other colleagues to, to know what is, uh, what is this case, how it is managed. So as definitely you're going to meet such a case another time. So your approach will be different. Let's move now to another totally different problem, the problem of visualization. You have whatever type of cataract, but you cannot see. The best example, if you have such an extensive corneal opacity, this patient, you can do triple procedure. Cataract alone is extremely difficult. So here, my plan was to do dark, to remove this opacity and to work on the de desmet membrane and do as layer. Here I'm trying the bubble, injecting the bubble. It was not perfect, but still you can do your man manual dissection. You can see here, <clears throat> now I will put some viscoelastic just to to see how is my visualization will be after the dissection. See now, I put viscoelastic. And what I have now is essentially desmet membrane and dual layer. So I found that the visualization is perfect. I just, I'm going to show you how this layer alone can withstand the surgery. So with excellent visualization, I'm doing instead of doing in before we would do triple procedure, like penetrating keratoplasty, here the triple procedure is dark. You have the advantage of dark and you have the advantage of doing fake omasification. In penetrating keratoplasty, you will do an extra capsular surgery. Here, and the eye is open. Here, you're, you are always working in a closed space. So this is exactly, as you can see, the visualization is perfect. It's like a normal FACO case. And my settings were the, exactly the same. You see, I'm doing the regular chopping. Everything is regular. I don't have like fluctuations of the anterior chamber. The, the membrane or the layer left is very taut, very strong. And this gives you an advantage. There are different types of corneal opacities. Not every corneal opacity you need to do a combined procedure like this. Sometimes you have to uh, ma maneuver around the opacity. Sometimes you can use uh, fiber optic or that we use it in vitrectomy to give indirect elimination so you can perform your surgery. But some cases, the only choice is to do a combined procedure, keratoplasty and uh, Cataract FACO emulsification, one of the best techniques is doing this technique, dark plus FACO emulsification. So this is one challenge, just one example of a challenge of 
bad visualization, how you can overcome this by dividing the problem into it, uh, its uh, components and then dealing with each component in the best way to get the best result for this patient. This is the best possible technique for the comfort of the, of the patient and the safety and less possibility of rejection of the graft. And remember, these patients are old patients and the most feared complications in such patients are in doing open uh, sky keratoplasty is expulsive hemorrhage. Now this is because I'm doing dark, I'm removing the membrane, the desmet membrane, and keeping this desmet membrane to use it for a DMEC patient later on. So you can even make a benefit for another patient in another indication. And then putting the graft and, and suturing. You can have a challenge if you have a complication. If we complications can be from large wound, central wound, bad rexes, there, there can be so many complications. I'm going to address only one part of a part of a complication where you can have a, a posterior capsule rupture and you have still chunks of the nucleus. The the question you have you always to ask. If you have a posterior capsule rupture, is there is vitreous or no vitreous? If there is no vitreous, try not to get vitreous. Here, I'm using the capsular axis of, after tamponating the anterior vitreous face, uh, face with viscoelastic. And then trying to get the nucleus fragments with the capsular axis. The capsular axis forceps is an excellent forceps to hold and grasp fragments like this. You, are, you don't want the fragments to fall back. So I, it, it's kept over the iris and with the viscoelastic, I tamponate the anterior chamber and form it and then try to get these fragments out. Once you get it out, you can deal with the situation. If you need to do anterior vitrectomy, you think, well, should I implant the lens? Don't, the, the problem will complicate if you lose parts of the nucleus into the posterior segment. Here there was vitreous. Now I'm doing anterior vitrectomy. This is dry anterior vitrectomy at the beginning, but so long I don't have a, much of nucleus, you, can, you don't need to uh, put irrigation at this point. Now this is dry aspiration of the cortex, checking after removing the cortex, the remnants of the back, the anterior rex is, is okay. You inflate the space between the capsule, capsular remnants and the iris with viscoelastic in all quadrants, then you implant the lens. The best lens for this situation is a three-piece lens like this in this case. You just make, need to make sure that the first haptic goes in front of the capsule remnants behind the iris. Then you inject viscoelastic to form the anterior chamber and you can then rotate the lens. Don't worry, it will not fall if you are rotating in the right plane and inflating the bag properly. Here I'm looking for the other haptic using a Kugler hook and making sure the haptic is rotating in front of the remnants of the capsule. Once you, you center the lens, you check for any vitreous. That is present. So long you know and you can see what are you doing, don't worry of rotating the lens because sometimes people, you're like, ما تلعبش خلاص سيبها كده. You don't want to be surprised next morning that the lens is displaced. This is very extremely important. You have to finish your job during uh, the case, during the surgery itself. Don't expect uh, some miracle that will happen and will help you without doing your job. Now let's move to the another situation 
Well, at the end of your surgery, you can doing irrigation aspiration, regular case, simple case, you're doing irrigation aspiration. Take care, I'm using high magnification as always. Here, I caught the posterior capsule and I did a tear. In slow motion, you can see I'm holding the capsule and it was torn, not because I hold the capsule, because I pulled my hand. I didn't see it at the moment. And the, the high magnification let you see the complication happening. And in this way, I could prevent vitreous loss. So I kept the infusion in, got out with aspiration, injecting viscoelastic to tamperate the vitreous phase and tamperate the tape, forming the anterior chamber and then pulling out the irrigation. You don't go out directly. So the tear is like you see, you see here is, is, is like a triangle. So the, there is no vitreous. I decided I will, I want to convert. I'm just checking if there is any vitreous filament here. So I'm injecting viscoelastic and you can tell there is no vitreous because the edges are not round. I'm trying now to convert following the rules of posterior capsular axis to convert this dangerous tear that can extend if I want to implant the lens in the capsular bag, I'm converting it into a circular opening. And this is very important and you cannot do this unless you, you, you are used to work with high magnification because you can see the problem happening and then you can manage the problem in the right way that you want. Now, once you complete your axis, you have an intact, rest of the posterior capsule is intact this is not a dangerous opening in the posterior capsule. You inject viscoelastic tamponading the vitreous phase, injecting viscoelastic to inflate the capsular bag so as it can accommodate the intraocular lens to be implanted in the capsular bag exactly as intended without a complication. So the idea here, you can be faced with a challenge like a complication like this at the end of your surgery and the challenge here is that you want to solve the problem and get the, exactly the same result that you are you were going to get if you did not have the complication. Here, I opted to implant the, the, the lens first in the capsular bag, and then I can remove safely with the irrigation aspiration the remaining cortex. So this is an example of the importance of good visualization and the understanding of the options in front of you and the concept of the problems that can happen if you don't manage properly. Let's move now to awkward, awkward uh, situations. Actually, this is very awkward, but this is really me. Yeah, this is truly me. Yeah, so this is a very awkward situation. I'm going to share with you now some awkward and strange situations or difficult situations that we can meet, any one of us can meet, and some are rare. So this is a case that is finishing perfectly, finishing, everything is fine, I'm hydrating, I'm leaving, I'm preparing the next case, and then suddenly I saw a bump Look, concentrate, um, everything looks fine. Lens in place, hydrating, no problem. But I noticed something, you see, when I look carefully, you can see this is going fine, fine, but here it's like a hump here in this area. So I decided to go in and try to see what is this, and then here you go, you find a nucleus fragment. I have a whole lecture about hide, hidden fragments. This is something that you, we should all be aware of, particularly if the pupil gets narrow. If you're working with a nucleus of grade three or more, usually, if you have a fragment while doing chopping that flies away during the surgery, don't wait until the end because you will forget about it. Sometimes it goes to the area of the nudes and it's entrapped there. And these patients will come to you after one week, after one month, after two years. We have seen cases coming after you two years. During this period, they have bouts of either iritis, increase in intraocular pressure, sometimes localized areas of coronary decompensation, 
and if you are not aware of this problem, you will be very positive, you will be very challenged. You don't know why this is happening. So always try to avoid this by making sure at the end of the surgery, you, do, you, look, you check under the iris, just even with the irrigation cannula, irrigation aspiration, to make sure there are no fragments. And better even is during your surgery itself, don't let any fragments, even if small fragments, fly away. This is very important. It is not uncommon. And you have to have it in mind. Otherwise, it's really very disturbing. This is another situation after a hard cataract. You remove the hard cataract and then you find this opacity in the posterior capsule. Your options either to try to vacuum clean, wash it, or to do peeling or capsulorexis, posterior capsulorexis. It, this needs training again in high magnification, as you can see. Actually, I'm not doing posterior capsulorexis. This is a membrane over the posterior capsule that you can raise an edge and with the capsular axis, you can peel the membrane over the posterior capsule. It is not that difficult. It needs training and dextry and high magnification. If you think that the retina people can peel the internal limiting membrane, definitely we as anterior segment surgeons, we can peel fibrotic membranes over the posterior capsule. So in this case, I managed to have the result, post-operative post visual results as intended, and I saved the patient doing YAG laser that can have other complications or fit the lens. This is one of the things are challenging, but you should know how to do it. Let's move to another interesting Think this is a case, regular case, nice case. Once I implanted, it seemed the nurse was holding it with a two forceps. I found this pitting in the center of the nucleus. I tried to move the lens around. Maybe I can hide it in the periphery. But unfortunately, there was no way to deal with this opacity. It's central. It's going to make the patient miserable, particularly if the patient is very oriented or well educated and he needs good vision. So I had no choice but to take a decision intraoperative to remove the lens after I finished the case. Now, so I inject viscoelastic, trying to inflate the bag, to inflate the anterior chamber, and trying now to get the lens out of the capsular bag. You see, I'm, I'm pu pulling on the capsule itself. You have to be very careful to go under the anterior capsule rather than doing this, because you can do induced zonulysis. Now the first haptic is out. My aim is to get this into the anterior chamber, the lens. Once you get the first haptic out, the rest of delivering the lens is easier. Always protect your cornea, always protect your posterior capsule with viscoelastic. Of course, it's a stressful situation because you just finished your surgery with no problem. Then I have to cut. Nowadays, I have a special scissor that makes this process easier. But this is, I'm using a Westcott scissor and a Kugler to, to counter, do counter pressure to be able to cut. You can cut it in two halves, but this was not enough. It was not equal. So I decided to cut it in, into a third part. So as to make it easy to, to take it out from the same incision. Viscoelastic is extremely important. You have to make sure the lens is not touching or hitting the cornea endothelium. Once I cut it in the three pieces, I inject viscoelastic and you can hold each piece, a piece and get it out. Now it's small enough to pass from the incision. You get one piece and then you get the second piece and always try to orient it in the axis of the incision so as to be easy to pull it out. This is the last part. Always watching the posterior capsule. Now the lens is out. I have to check the posterior capsule, inject viscoelastic and then check in, inject a new lens in the capsular bag hoping that it is not pitted at the first one.
Here, the nice thing about hydrophobic acrylic, like this one, the thickness, are slowly unfolding haptics that give you time to evaluate the situation and to push the lens into the capsular bag safely. This case, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. This case is very interesting and it tells you some of the challenges. I did her surgery, for example, yesterday, post-operative, first post-operative visit was today. I saw her, the pupil was narrow. Otoref is giving high astigmatism. I didn't know why she's not seeing well. So I dilated the pupil. And then I found the lens in this awkward position. This is next day post-operative. So the lens actually is tilted on almost on its edge. I would not see this unless I have dilated the pupil like this. So I told the, the patient, although it's tough to tell the patient that he needs another interference next day, but it's better to tell the patient the facts and you are able to solve the problem by taking utmost precautions not to induce another problem. So I told the patient, the lens just needs to be adjusted and you have to go to the OR again tomorrow. So I admitted the patient, dilated the pupil, and threw already the fresh paracentesis. Already you don't need to open new openings, just go through the paracentesis, it's easily already opened with viscoelastic. You see injecting viscoelastic, filling the bag and filling the anterior chamber here from the main wound. You can see the lens. Actually, the haptic is kinked. That's why the lens is tilted like this. So I'm checking, trying to understand. You see, it's kinked, the, the haptic is kinked. So all you need to do now is to get this haptic out without injuring the posterior capsule. It's very easily, you can very easily injure the posterior capsule or you can very easily, when it unfolds, injure the corneal endothelium. So it's very important to protect and fill the capsular bag with viscoelastic to be able to re-maneuver this haptic that is kinked in a very strange way without catching the posterior capsule. Once you were able to do this, the lens settled perfectly in place and problem is solved. Of course, in any case, in any cataract case I do, in any secondary surgery I do, I inject intracapsular uh, uh, mox Vigamox or Fortimox, whatever, into the preservative free into the capsular bag to avoid the risk of infection because here you have a risk of infection as well post-operative. So this is a very interesting case. So that the, the message here is at the, well, even whatever, how many surgeries you do, how, however the situation it is, just make sure that the lens settles at the end of the surgery in the proper place, in the, in the proper shape. Okay, this is interesting. This is another awkward case that I learned by time, what is this? And I always ask my residents, if I see a case or my assistants or my colleagues, I make a quiz and tell them, tell me what's this? This is a patient, I did him 10 years earlier, cataract surgery, perfect cataract surgery. He came after 10 years telling me that he's not seeing as he used to see. So, I examined him. It looks like as if this patient have cataract. Some, some of my younger colleagues, I show them the picture. They tell me, oh, it's very obvious cataract. Those, if I tell him, uh, this patient have done cataract already. So I will say lens opacification. Okay, it's one option. It can be an option. Or some people will tell you this is posterior capsule opacification. So look, this is in, in the video. You can see the lens reflection. Actually, the posterior capsule is back here. And this is the lens and there is fluid 
between the posterior surface of the lens and the posterior capsule. This is not posterior capsule opacification. This is not lens opacification. This is what we call capsular block. Here, the lens, this is more clear. This is the reflection of the lens, these two lines. And this is the posterior capsule here. And in between, there is fluid, turbid fluid filling the, the space. And this is what causes the vision to decrease. This is called late capsular block syndrome. And you should learn about it and look for it if the patient is coming to you and you think it's a, only a posterior capsule opacification. You have to examine the patient properly to, the, to see this and diagnose this particular problem. The solution for this problem are different. There are many su different suggestions. One of them is to do YAG laser. The problem of YAG laser is good, it's easy, but the problem, this fluid will just move backwards into the vitreous, will have turbidity that will take long time that sometimes will disturb the patient. So in this patient, I decided, I told him, okay, you have this problem. I think it's better that we wash this uh, turbid fluid. You have to diagnose it first. So once I diagnosed, so I told him, okay, we I will admit you. And he agreed on this. And just to, to show you, this is 10 years postoperatively. If you didn't, if you have done proper capsular access and implanted the lens in the capsular bag, even after 10 years, you can reopen the capsular bag. This is important to know. I'm injecting the viscoelastic here, inflating the anterior chamber, trying to inflate it and trying to start an edge, a space between the anterior capsular rim and the lens. Here, I'm going to use the Koch uh, aspiration cannula, which is flat. So I will try just to go there. Look, once I start, and this is the irrigating cannula, which is sharp. I use it as a spatula. Look to the red reflex. I'm now opening like an envelope, the capsular bag, switching hands. Okay, opening the capsular bag again. Once I'm sure it's open, just when I, once I open with the fluid going in, look to all this steam coming out. It's all cortical fibers, sequestered cortical fibers, somering rings, metaplastic epithelial cells that fill the bag. Look to the red reflex, it's completely regained. Make sure to remove any remnants of these clusters of epithelial cells that is inhabiting the equator of the lens. It's just irrigation aspiration. It's clusters, clumps of cells, cleaning, vision, the, the red reflex is restored. So I did, the mission is accomplished. So this is one way to go in such cases. Of course, you can do YAG capsulotomy, but I prefer if the patient agrees to do this because this is, doesn't have uh, residual problems afterwards if everything is going fine, if you can open the capsular bag. And almost most of the time you can open the capsular bag regardless of how many years. This is just a giant fluke image just to show you that what is the pathology you see this is the lens and this is the fluid behind it the turbid fluid and this is the posterior capsule shell once you clean the bag the lens comes resting on the posterior capsule as it should be so this shows you exactly the pathology of this problem which is called late capsular block syndrome this is another interesting case this patient is an 18 years old patient. She said she came presenting to us of that she wants to improve her vision. She did cataract surgery when she was young. 
and she came with this appearance. Actually, it was really puzzling. We asked everybody to come and have a look on this case. It's very interesting. It's very interesting to see this case. Okay, I'm sorry. So actually, by if we, we uh, any proper examination and proper history taking, this patient has underwent YAG laser capsulotomy in some area. And the surgeon, it seems, was so generous that he was able to make a hole in a PMMA lens using YAG laser. And the patient, with, when we do correction for her, with a correction, she improved to 0.3 or 2070, uh, which is a good vision for such a patient. But then you have to take a decision. There is no other way except of explanting the lens. And don't think the challenge was only stopped at the po point of diagnosing the problem, but it's not easy here, as you will see. This is a PMMA lens. So I, you, you, you should know that usually in young patients operated young, they can have the posterior synechia not only at the edge of the pupil, but covering all the posterior aspect of the surface of the iris to the whole capsule and the lens. And you can see it's very tight. It's not as easy as I could imagine. And you can see bleeding and tearing of the iris. So I'm trying to cut it loose because I have to remove this lens. So it's not easy dissecting the synechia from the whole back surface of the iris. Being patient, trying to see at each point what is the problem that is preventing me from accessing the lens. You can use as many innovations as you want. Here I'm using a sharp dissector, with it, which is an MVR, always keeping viscoelastic in the eye. Now, at least I can see the lens. I can liberate it from its place where it was stuck. It's definitely a PMMA, a PMMA lens that I need to enlarge the wound. I'm trying to cut it, to hold it. It's, it's, it's a PMMA lens, I cannot cut it. So I widened the wound and I got it out. You see there is vitreous definitely here, pulling behind. So I got the lens out and just to prove that it, it has the hole, which is very interesting. This is the hole in the lens. So you can see how challenging this case is, how strange it is. So now I start to tackle the second problem, this vitreous, I'm going to clean the vitreous and then try to put a new lens in place after doing proper vitrectomy. I'm checking the iris and the capsule, what is remaining, I'm trying to move these iris pigments. Viscoelastic is injected in the aim to inflate in each quadrant, each part of the space between the iris and the capsule to create a space with the viscoelastic to have the lens getting in. Here I'm using a three-piece lens, foldable lens actually. I didn't need to fold it, but the haptics design will allow very nice centration of the lens and placement easily and manipulations of the haptic to be able to implant it behind the iris. Then once the lens is placed in position with a clear capsulotomy, then I will try to fix what I did of uh, insulting the iris. So I will try to do some iridoplasty just to be able to constrict the pupil as well. Of course, it's an extra step, but it is worth doing. After I close the wound, you have to close it. Then I will suture the iris here using 
a curved long needle of 10-0 proline. There are so many ways to correct this, to do this technique, but it needs some patience, some training, and then once you are done, you are, I'm fixing what I've done wrong and getting the pupil more round and the post-operative results of this patient, result of this patient, interesting patient, was actually very good and we achieved the pre-operative best corrected visual acuity with uncorrected visual acuity post-operative with the lens placed with the right power in the right place. This is my last uh, awkward case. This is a child that actually was sent for me as it is a congenital cataract or some form of congenital cataract. On examining the patient, actually there was no cataract in this patient, but there is a remnant of the pupillary membrane from the embryonic life, but occupying the center of the pupil. This is dilated pupil view, and this is obscuring the vision. It's affecting the vision as if the patient has cataract, but he does not do ca have cataract. So the challenge here was is I need to remove this without removing the lens. If I can keep for a child his lens with all the benefits of a crystalline lens, this would be perfect for the child visual development. So here you have to use viscoelastic, a lot of viscoelastic. You can use a viscodispersive and also viscocohesive to give you space. Very carefully, you see the importance of high magnification because you can see every detail is you will be able to see what you are looking for how you are going to remove this with while saving the anterior capsule from puncture so gently just peeling this pupillary membrane from over the lens you can see behind it is completely clear there is no reason for this patient to do a lens surgery using plenty of viscoelastic helps to protect the cornea, protect the lens. Here I'm removing all the strands, all the connections. Now I have micro scissors that, that looks nicer and it, may, you may, it helps you to manipulate in a nice way. But the message here that you can be faced with a challenge again here, you can, make, you can take a wrong decision and it will be, for me, it will be a problem if I, I would have removed the lens of this patient. And the only problem was the presence of this pupillary membrane and the results that you give to the patient are exactly what they expect from you. So in conclusion, challenges are numerous. You can face the challenges at any step of the surgery. You can see, anticipate the challenges in certain patients preoperatively to plan, like the one with corneal opacity, you have to order uh, uh, a graft or the patient, the old patient, where he has to sit in a certain, sleep in a certain way, and you have to work in a very awkward uh, uh, situation. So it's very important that you prepare yourself for so many varieties of uh, challenges. Not everything is regular, and you will always be able to learn by seeing patients, by doing more surgeries, by see, seeing other surgeons and learning from their experiences and faults as well. So I would like to conclude this and thank you very much.